The impact of European cuisines on the West has been very close, I would say up until about the 18th, 19th century. Uh, the flavors and flavor combinations and the spices and the uh, even the techniques were much closer um, in antiquity and in the Middle Ages and then European cuisine started to drift off about 1650 into what we now know of, uh, know of as classical French haute cuisine um, and then it becomes very very different, different logic underlying it um, meaning that Asian cuisine looked very strange to people who were eating as Europeans. <laughs> it's a very strange story. I was teaching in Boston um, this past summer and they put me up in a high-rise dorm and there was a beautiful kitchen in there without a single utensil, not a pot, not a fork, not nothing. And so I went down to this little Asian grocery store a few blocks away and said, okay, I'm just gonna get whatever I need to get me through the next few weeks. And I bought a little pot and I saw a box of ramen noodles. I've never actually eaten ramen noodles. <laughs> it was one of those things that was just off my radar in college and I didn't really know much about it. And I thought, all right, I'll doctor it up. I'll get some shrimp and I'll buy some vegetables and throw it in a tiny little pot and just make this every morning for breakfast. And it was like a revelation. Suddenly <laughs> this world opened up of noodles for breakfast. And I thought, all right, I have to do this well. I have to start making the stocks on my own. I have to make noodles handmade. Um, I need to add really, really good ingredients and carefully think about it. And it just sort of took me down this path of complete obsession, which is sort of the way I do anything. And so I've been eating uh, noodle soup every single morning for breakfast. Um, and usually making everything but from scratch. You know, on some quick mornings I'll use a uh, noodle that's pre-made or I'll use a stock that's um, pre-made, but I've got a whole freezer full of, you know, like pho stock and shrimp and vegetables you know, and uh, lobster stock and other things. You just take one of those out, <laughs> you know, uh, put it in the pot, add some, some noodles that I've made on the weekend, and it really is a lot of fun. There are two different techniques, and I think I kind of overstated the, the difference between them because, of course, you find all techniques throughout Asian cultures. Um, but I think in sort of indicative of the way noodle soups are made, uh, at least, is usually the, in a Japanese noodle soup, you'll find something like in, um, in uh, tonkatsu, they'll bread and fry the pork first, slice it up and place it on the soup, which never really made sense to me because the crust gets all soggy, but in any case, it, but it tastes good, you know? Um, and there's that way of doing it, where you're cooking it first and then adding it nicely arranged. There's another way, which I actually prefer, is to, you know how you'd sort of marinate a piece of meat, thinly slice it, add soy sauce, ginger, whatever, and then add a starch that would, when you fry it, sort of give it a nice crisp crust, brown it, and then you add the vegetables and stir fry and whatever. That same exact technique, you can just take that thing, slip it into the soup, two minutes, it's done, and you'll, and you'll have this, like, all the moisture stays in and it stays really nice and pleasant and delicate and it's not overcooked. Um, I did that yesterday morning, in fact, <laughs> with, a, with like a, just a regular pork chop. You know, you just slice it up and I didn't even, yeah, used maybe half of it. Um, and that works really, really nicely. The students that we'll have in our food studies program are really a mix from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some come directly out of their undergraduate uh, degrees. It's a, it's a master's degree in food studies. Some have come out of the industry. Some are people who want to just do this for fun, you know, so, and a range of ages, a range of backgrounds and everything. So we haven't started yet, so I'm not exactly sure who will have, but the um, focus of the whole program is really giving people the research skills and the writing and the critical theory and everything so that the, the tools that they can use to approach food from an academic vantage point. And then um, ideally they'll be able to apply that to a job, you know, like take it to an employer and say, I can do this, this, and this. You need a marketer. I know food. I know how, you know, what makes people tick. I know how to do research. I know, you know, um, so I'm thinking that the way that people have worked in the industry traditionally is they'll get an MBA and they will know prob probably nothing about food at all and then they'll get a job and then they'll have to kind of learn in this six months training whatever and that seems really backwards to me. It should be someone who really knows the issues and understands what good practices in in growing food and cooking it and distribution and, and retail and everything um, and even in aesthetics you know what really makes good food and I think that would make our food supply much better. I think we're, we're, we will eat better, we'll be healthier, we'll be more sustainable, we'll be more equable in the way who has access to food. So those are, those are the kind of issues that we're gonna work throughout the program and hopefully infiltrate the world you know, with, our, with our graduates.
I hope to communicate that there has been a, I wouldn't say a, a prejudice against fusion, but this, this, relux, this idea that somehow there is an authentic cuisine, there's a right way to do things in a wrong way, and of course that's what French chefs, you know, French training tells you is there's a classic dish. And for much of Asian cuisine also, there's a, you know, uh, an idea that if you mess with the ingredients or if you, you know, throw in some technique that doesn't make sense that it's a kind of bastardization. And I would like people to think of it more as an evolution in that all cuisines always adopt foreign ingredients. Think of, you know, spaghetti and meatballs with tomato sauce. <laughs> Tomatoes are not native to Italy, they're American, you know. So I think that the willingness to adopt new techniques, new flavor combinations, different ingredients, has always been a part of the evolution of cuisine, and it should be still, is that the, the whole idea of like sort of ossifying a recipe and saying this is the way it must be done, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with writing a recipe and copywriting it and saying, you know, here's a, a one very good way to do it, but I think people should be given the freedom to experiment and explore, and in my talk I'm going to uh, speak how that has always been the case through history and how Eastern and Western cuisines were once much very uh, much more close than they are today um, Especially in the way they combine flavors. Uh, it's a there's a word that I've coined um, Called polysavory meaning that there are lots of different flavors that go together sweet sour pungent spicy salty and They kind of work against each other in ways that like polyphony does in music and I think that what has happened in Western cuisine is we tend to think of flavors harmonizing. We make a stock out of the main ingredient, we add garnishes that complement but don't contrast, and we've kind of banished the spices and to the end of the meal, we've put the sweets all the way at the end of the meal, and we don't like to have those flavor combinations, at least in classic French cooking, you really don't find really sour, sweet and sour, or spicy and pungent or, you know, you don't find those combinations that are very interesting in Asia, much of Asian cuisine. Um, and I'm going to try and talk of how they were, one's very close and how they veered off and how now really they're coming back together again is that, that you know, chefs everywhere are borrowing these combinations. You know, you wouldn't find it strange to find cilantro and lime and sriracha on something, on a Western dish. And it works, you know, because, uh, and I think it, it actually always did work. And, and in a sense, we're getting back to where we once were. Um, in the Middle Ages, really. I would not see it as a danger that chefs are using sea buckthorn <laughs> from Scandinavia, um, but I understand what you mean, that we're in the middle of a communications revolution, very much like that that was initiated with printing. You know, in the 15th century, people all of a sudden had access to recipes and wanted to imitate them, and there were books that came out telling you how to throw a great banquet, which is something that I've written about, and how to um, cook a certain dish, what's healthy for you or not, and what it does is it kind of, you're right, shepherds people into one way of thinking, and then fads happen much quicker, right? Is, is that everyone will want the latest new ingredient, and the next year they'll have to find a new one, because then once everyone's doing it, it's not really of interest anymore. So I think with the computer revolution in, in communications, the ideas just happen quicker now, <laughs> you know, so uh, an ingredient can come into fashion and be out within a couple of months. And I think, you know, the moment it shows up in Bon Appetit or Food and Wine, it's done. You know, then it's completely common. And I think the, the trends that we're seeing, and this is really just my opinion, I'm not, I'm not sure how it will play out, but notice how playing with machines in the kitchen is kind of not that exciting anymore because, you know, you, you, can, you can buy a sous vide machine in the grocery store now or a little alginate kit to make your beaded, you know, gels or whatever. So that it's, to do that in a restaurant is really not on the cutting edge, not hip. And so it's not, I wouldn't, I would say it's not just communications and the web and, you know, blogging, but I think it's also the manufacturers of um, tools. I think it's also the distributors of ingredients. You know, you can go online on Amazon and buy sodium citrate and, you know, make, I, I did this just for kicks. I bought a, um, a whipped cream machine and I took some cheese and I realized that to get the cheese to, you know, amalgamate, you, uh, you need to add sodium citrate, which sort of, Gives it this. Um, it keeps it to get keeps it from clumping, and put it in the whipped cream machine and made the fit. You know the squirty cheese and this stuff. So I made this just just for the hell of it. It was a lot of fun, and um, the point is that anyone can do that now. You know, there's nothing nothing special about it, and I think that you know it had wonderful kitsch value. But but as uh, you know, to do that in a restaurant, I think people will go. So what? Who cares? You know. So 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 you're right. I think the web has changed the way people get their information and how quickly trends come and go. 
And, and I think it's, of course, it's changed the publishing industry too, completely, is that now, unless you have a TV program or some platform a business, you know, or something like that, so your name is known, it's actually really hard to get books published in the trade now, cookbooks. You know, uh, they're getting published in lots of other ways, other types of publishers, or self-publishing, uh, and people are putting things online that are, it's just much, much easier to do now. So I think that's, that's something we're going to see in the next decade or so. I think the publishing industry is going to have to reinvent itself or it's going to crash and burn, basically. You know, for the moment, they're selling a lot of books, and cookbooks are actually among the highest selling um, literature, you know, cookbooks and romances <laughs> and things like that. But it's, it's. Um, I think it's going to change. The business model is going to have to change. Mm -hmm. The rate of change ha has become broader, but I think the um, geographic scope and uh, has widened in a way that you could really have been isolated even 50 years ago. If you had a certain cuisine and disconnection from the rest of the world, you would evolve on your own. But I think it's kind of impossible now for people to you know, be ignorant of what's going on in Brunei or in Peru or, you know, there are cuisines around and it's very easy to find that information. You just put it into a Google search and you can find, you know, a YouTube of someone doing something. The, what I find really fascinating though is the, the sheer bulk of information that's out there has, is sometimes overwhelming. Like if you look at a recipe site, for example, and type in lasagna, you will get one million hits. And they're all bad. <laughs> they're all not really terrible recipes. So in a way, what has happened, which is completely counter to what I just said about the trends in cookbooks, is the voice of authority is actually a lot more important now, is that people trust successful chefs and those that have restaurants. Of course, that's a great platform to launch a cookbook um, in that there's just so much information they don't know how to cull the good from the bad. And they're willing to trust someone who has a a show or a great test kitchen or a chef who's got a successful restaurant. Um, so, so the voice of authority has actually become more important, strangely enough, um, in a way that, you know, when Julia Child wrote, <laughs> she was, no one knew who she was. Just came out and did this cookbook and the, you know, a lot of publishers rejected it, but finally it, it hit. But she was not known at all. And that's, that's what's very different now. Advice to young chefs is have fun. <laughs> Don't be uptight about learning techniques and being told what the correct and, <laughs> and wrong way of doing things is because um, cooking should be a creative process. And I think that there is a type of person in the kitchen who likes to follow a recipe, who says this is the correct way to do it, and if you veer off one inch, you're gonna have disaster in the kitchen. And of course, that's not what cooking is like. Maybe if you, maybe baking comes closer to, to that in some respects. You have to follow the proportions and measurements. But I would say 90% of all cooking is a lot more free. And if you like a whole lot of cloves, use it. You know, if you wanna cook it an extra hour, do it. You know, let it get, be brown. And I think that that, that um, sort of really fun aspect of cooking sometimes gets taken out when, um, and I understand why cooks make very specific, or why cookbook writers make very specific recipes, is they have to copyright them and put them in and sell them and, you know, and, and say this is the unique, you know, they have to sell themselves. Um, but I would say the better cook is one that's more adaptable, that can, play, that can use the ingredients that are at hand and can change pots, can change cooking, you know, uh, source, fuel sources and kind of be adaptable to, to the uh, situation at hand. And that's when really interesting cooking has, uh, happens. And uh, the willingness to experiment and play, I think is the best part about cooking. I mean, I wake up every morning and I think, what kind of noodle am I gonna make this morning? And sometimes it's completely serendipitous and crazy. Um, let me give you an example. A few weeks ago, um, I was in an Asian, there's a great Asian grocery store, it's in Stockton. And there's, uh, this would not have been the case, I think even five, five or six years ago, it was illegal to sell blood. Um, and if you go into the, behind the counter, they sell, they have a big bucket of blood. It's five, five bucks for like a gallon. And I've made like, you know, boudin noir out of them and done things like that in the past. But I thought, what would happen if I took the blood and added flour and just made noodles out of it. And of course, it was, I didn't realize <clears throat> there is an actual recipe <laughs> using that exactly like that. It's Blutknudel and it's, you know, Tyrolean and, and uh, Austrian. Um, but that didn't matter. I was just like playing with it. And I tried rolling them out and got a nice flat noodle, but the re really nice is extruded. So you use a slightly wetter dough. And I've got a, um, what's called a torquio. It's just a big brass tube with a die at the bottom and a big handle like this and you crank it out. And the noodles um, came out just perfectly, perfect thin cylindrical uh, vermicelli that are dark, really, really dark and taste 
like faintly like iron and meat. It's, it's beautiful. It's an absolutely gorgeous recipe. Um, and so I love these so much that I made a huge batch of them, boiled them, dehydrated them, and put them in little Ziploc bags so you can just open one packet and you know, mail them to friends to terrify them and things like that. But that's, but that's the kind of you know, fun that you, have in the, you should have in the kitchen. I think if you're just thinking of it as rote and like, oh, oh gosh, I have to make another one of these, and then it suddenly loses its, its thrill but it's very much like a uh, creation in any art form, is you play with your tools, you play with your medium, uh, you play with the ingredients, and, uh, and wonderful things happen.